Hi, I'm R. And I'm Jay. And today, we'll be exploring the top 10 common arguments from anti-vaxxers. This list doesn't by any means cover all arguments that anti-vaxxers make, but they are the ones we hear most commonly. Let's get to it. Number one, vaccines are ineffective. I find this argument one of the most unusual out of the entire list, as it is just blind denial of the evidence and ignorance of basic biology. But I primarily think this one stems from ignorance of how vaccines actually work. So I'll give a quick rundown of how vaccines work. A vaccine contains a modified version of the virus. This modified version typically has its contagious and damaging abilities heavily stunted. This vaccine is then injected into the body where it currently isn't recognized by the immune system. Spindle cells will then pick up the virus and alert the immune system of it. The immune system then develops antibodies to the virus and releases them throughout the body. Lymphocytes then start attacking the virus. After the weakened version of the virus is gone, the immune system then keeps the antibodies so they can respond quickly and effectively to an exposure to the virus later in life, even in its full form. This process can be directly observed in the lab, and there are a vast number of studies outlining the mechanisms as to how vaccines work and studies on their effectiveness. You can find multiple studies examining the effects of introducing a vaccine into a heavily diseased population and drastically reducing the incidence and mortality rate of the disease. So for example, measles is a highly infectious disease caused by a virus. Before the introduction of the measles vaccine to the USA in the mid-60s, the incidence rate of measles ranged between 300 and 800,000 cases per year. But after the vaccine was licensed, that rate dropped to below 50,000 cases per year year, which combined with lab demonstrations of the physiology behind the vaccine, it demonstrates the clear efficacy of the vaccine. Furthermore, the World Health Organization estimates between 2 to 3 million deaths each year are prevented by diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, and measles vaccines, but 1.5 million children under the age of 5 still die from these diseases every year as a result of low vaccination rates in their specific countries. Number two, death rates declined well before the vaccine is released. Looking at overall death rates as an argument against vaccines is incredibly dishonest, or at least shows a poor understanding of the significance of these statistics. As time goes on, medical care improves at an accelerating rate, so of course the death rates of these vaccine-preventable diseases will decrease relative to the changes in medical care. It is also often argued by many anti-vaccine advocates that improvements in hygiene are responsible for the decreased incidence of vaccine-preventable diseases, rather than the vaccines themselves. This is in fact partially true. Obviously, as we better understand hygiene practices, risk of infection decreases as we are able to take preventable measures. However, this does not account for the significant decrease in infection rates that we see in highly contagious diseases, such as the measles. The issue is that improvements in medical care don't necessarily reduce the incidence rate of the disease, and hygiene is only a limited factor in the transmission of infection. Measles has an infection rate of around 90%. That's 9 out of 10 people who come in contact with the infected individual who will also become infected. Hygiene alone is not sufficient to control such a rate of infection, and though modern medicine reduces the risk of death from measles, one in every 20 children that gets measles will get pneumonia. In the early 1900s, that would mean death. However, as medical care improves, that pneumonia no longer always results in death. But regardless, the children still had to get and suffer through the experience of having pneumonia, not to mention any of the long-term side effects it could leave them with. Vaccines prevent you from being dragged into intensive care to receive emergency medical care and winding up with long-term side effects like loss of hearing. With vaccines, however, someone may wind up having a sore arm for a day and in very, very rare instances, a serious but treatable reaction. In both scenarios, no one dies, so the statistics don't represent the issue. However, one scenario is clearly the better one for the population. Death rates say absolutely nothing about the other's serious side effects or suffering associated with getting the disease. 3. There are no independent studies supporting vaccines. Now, there are a vast number of studies, and these studies come from multiple sources, including, but not limited to, public and private universities, 
government and private medical research facilities, and multiple pharmaceutical company labs. These diverse sources of research all publish their findings to the same group of journals, and from these journals, the sources take information and attempt to replicate and expand on the results. The only way this research could be not taken into consideration is if every single one of these is engaged in a global conspiracy to lie, as all it would take is one research facility to ruin this entire conspiracy, but we will save conspiracy talk for later. However, if you are looking for a list of studies, make sure to read the description section of this video. Number 4. If vaccines are effective, then people shouldn't be concerned about unvaccinated children in schools. This argument demonstrates a lack of understanding in regards to herd immunity and the large-scale dangers of an unvaccinated and dense population. Firstly, vaccines are not 100% effective. An individual immunized against a particular virus is still able to become infected with that disease if the immune response is not sufficient to fight against the infection. In fact, some immunizations only last a few years before the efficiency of the immune response is no longer sufficient to fight against the disease, and booster shots may be needed to maintain a strong immunity. A good example of this scenario is whooping cough. Many people may not have a strong enough immune response when given the immunization for whooping cough. However, those who are immunized against whooping cough demonstrate significantly reduced symptoms and are often not contagious to others. This significantly reduces the impact of the disease. When combined with herd immunity, this makes the impact of immunization even greater. Herd immunity is the principle that immune vulnerable individuals within a population are shielded against infection by those with strong immunity. Contagious diseases have very little impact when they are unable to spread within a population. By strengthening the majority of the population against the disease, barriers are created between the disease and the immune vulnerable individuals. This is especially important for people highly susceptible to disease, such as infants, the elderly, and the immunocompromised. So when an unvaccinated child is introduced into an environment with high chance of spreading a contagion, it may still pose a risk to others, even those vaccinated against the very same disease. Vaccines are about limiting any opportunity for the spread of a contagion, not just the protection of an individual. Number five, pharmaceutical companies don't care about the efficacy of vaccines, they only care about money. Yes, pharmaceutical industries make money from vaccines, but that doesn't mean by default that that's all they care about. They make money from them because they are an effective product that can be distributed on a large scale. But if the argument is that they aren't effective and vaccine companies lie to keep the money, then I can say it wouldn't be worth it for them. In 2010, pharmaceutical companies made around 1.3 trillion US dollars from various sources. However, from vaccines, they made about 24 billion. This means vaccines are tribute for about 1.82% of the pharmaceutical total income, which is a tiny portion of their income. It is also worth noting that out of that $24 billion income from vaccines, $10.5 billion of it is profits, making the profit margin about 43.8%, as opposed to the average of non-vaccine pharmaceutical profit margins of about 46.3%. This makes vaccines about 2.5% less effective at generating profits compared to the other things that pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies sell. In summary, pharmaceutical companies have a vast range of income sources and vaccines only attribute for a tiny portion of that income. That tiny portion of income isn't worth having a global conspiracy of causing serious harm to children for. Pharmaceutical companies make considerably more money off the medicine and equipment that would be used to treat someone who is hospitalized due to vaccines as opposed to the vaccines that are used to prevent diseases. If anything, they would make more money if they eliminated vaccines and just allowed everyone to get the diseases and be hospitalized. It is also worth noting that the companies would stand to lose money if they were selling an ineffective product as they would get sued constantly and have to fork out money to the National Vaccine Compensation Program along with the damage to their company that they would suffer as a result of public scrutiny. Someone would need to demonstrate that vaccines don't work, and then demonstrate that the companies are aware of this before this argument against vaccines can hold any water, and no one has done either of these things. Number 6. Vaccines cause autism. Well, I'm sure we all knew this one was coming. Let's just make this one clear and simple. There is no evidence linking vaccines with autism. The only study reporting a link between vaccines and autism was a study by Andrew Wakefield. He released this study and nobody could replicate his results. It was later discovered that he fabricated his results for a group of lawyers who wanted to sue a pharmaceutical company. 
Following this, Andrew Wakefield has medical license revoked and has been relegated to the lands of natural news for the rest of his days. It is also worth noting that even if the Andrew Wakefield study was true, it only showed a possible relationship. It didn't actually demonstrate a mechanism as to how vaccines could cause autism. Finally, a multitude of studies, even ones privately funded by anti-vaccine groups, have now been conducted, showing time and time again in multiple population groups that there is absolutely no link between vaccines and autism. I'm sure the debate will go on, but if evidence speaks for itself, then this argument has no voice. Number 7. Vaccines contain dangerous chemicals such as formaldehyde and mercury. It seems almost every month that the anti-vaccine crowd has moved on to claiming a new ingredient in vaccines is now killing our children. Now, we can't possibly sit here and kick balls at ever-shifting goalposts all day, but we can outline this. Vaccine safety has been heavily studied. It is one of the most well-explored things in science, and no evidence suggests that they are a public health risk. Almost everybody you ever meet has been vaccinated with no real issue to their health. Now, the two most commonly complained about ingredients in vaccines are formaldehyde and mercury, so we can talk about these quickly. The dose makes the toxin. Some things are deadly at certain levels and not dangerous at all at other levels. The amount of formaldehyde hide in vaccines is minuscule compared to the amount that the body actually produces itself which is about a hundred times higher than that found in vaccines yes you heard us right your body actually produces formaldehyde as it is essential for the production of biological materials the amount in vaccines is absolutely no danger to humans on the other hand, thimerosal is a compound that contains mercury, and it was used to prevent the growth of dangerous microbes in vaccines. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that thimerosal was associated with any negative health effects, as the levels are so low that they can be removed easily by the body. To add to this, so many people were worried about mercury in vaccines that mercury hasn't been a part of the vast majority of vaccines for over 15 years. Again, this argument holds no water against vaccines vaccines. As there is no evidence to suggest thimerosal is dangerous, there is lots of evidence to suggest it's safe in the dose it is given, and there is only a very small number of vaccines that even still use thimerosal. Number 8. Vaccines cause more harm than good. This claim can be easily refuted using simple math. These vaccines exist because the disease they fight are highly contagious and have a deceivingly high rate of complications. So much so, the government supplied millions of dollars in funding research to get many of these vaccines ready as fast as possible. For example, measles is so contagious that each person who gets it will infect 90% of the people they come in contact with, excluding those who are already immune. The disease has a death rate of around 1 in 2,500 cases. So when 1 million children get measles, 400 will die. And in further complications, 1 in every 20 children that gets measles will get pneumonia. So if 1 million children get measles, then 50,000 will get pneumonia, which puts them at serious risk of permanent injury. On a large scale, the toll really starts to add up. The complication rate of vaccines doesn't even come close to this. For example, the incidence rate of allergic reactions such as anaphylaxis with the MMR vaccine is 3.5 to 10 per 1 million doses. So if 1 million children get the vaccine, at most 10 children will have a serious allergic reaction and this reaction does not necessarily mean death or even permanent injury. These allergic reactions usually stem from a pre-susceptibility as opposed to a problem with the vaccine itself. It is also worth noting that we haven't even included the negative effects of mumps and rubella in the analysis, and the vaccine still comes out on top. Now, these numbers may vary depending on which vaccine you do the cost-benefit analysis of, but the vaccine will always come out as doing more good than harm. The only times when it seems like they don't are when the numbers are presented dishonestly so they include minor side effects such as sore arms after the needle injection or when the vaccines are blamed for side effects where there is no actual causal link between the vaccine and the side effect. A good example of this is what happened with the HPV vaccine in Japan where news and social media reported unverified cases of complications related to the vaccine and the government was forced to retract its recommendation for the vaccine because of misinformed public outrage and fear despite being advised against this by the World Health Organization. Check out our links in the description for more information. In summary, the World Health Organization estimates that 2-3 to three million deaths are prevented each year due to vaccinations, with minimal serious side effects. This is a massive good.
Number nine, vaccine preventable diseases are no longer a risk in my country, so there's no need to vaccinate. This is possibly the most interesting argument on this list, as this argument exists purely because vaccines are so effective and have eliminated these diseases from people's recent memory. Now, while it is true that a lot of diseases have reached minuscule levels in some countries, they still exist, and once the population is less resistant to the disease, those small pockets of the disease will be able to spread out again as they are highly infectious. Now, even if a disease is completely eradicated in one country, all it takes is for someone to come over on a plane from a different country that still has the disease and now it can explode into a population that has no resistance to it. Our world is so interconnected these days that only once a disease is completely eradicated from every corner of the globe can we consider the disease to no longer be a risk. Number 10. My friend's child got vaccinated and then X happened. This argument typically manifests itself in something to the effect of My friend's child got vaccinated and then was diagnosed with autism. We've already talked about the problems with vaccinations being linked to autism, but this section addresses the underlying thought pattern which leads to this argument as well as similar arguments about the side effects of vaccines. Possibly the most popular example of this is the one presented by Jenny McCarthy, who spoke out publicly against vaccines when her son was diagnosed with autism after he was vaccinated. This is textbook post-hoc reasoning, as multiple things can be chosen to fill the place of X. And the response is relatively easy. By saying my child got vaccinated and then won a sprint competition at his high school athletics carnival, so vaccines must improve athleticism. I did a fart and found $10 on the floor. Maybe farts are made of money. Or, I prayed to natural news before winning at slot machines. Hence, praying to natural news causes people to win at slot machines. But satire aside, it's actually not that unreasonable to turn to a recent and unique event to try and explain a similarly unique and recent outcome. That is because lots of things happen in correlation with each other every day, and humans are evolved to identify these patterns. However, this often results in people finding patterns where there are none. This is the reason we must implement the scientific method. We use it to minimize human bias as much as possible, and when we do this in regard to vaccines and autism, or vaccines and other undocumented side effects, there is no evidence to suggest vaccines cause a lot of the negative things they are accused of causing. In fact, there isn't even a large-scale correlation. Vaccines do have side effects, and some of them are very serious, but the instance of these side effects is incredibly low and often affects people who are immunocompromised or especially susceptible to reaction. The reality is that people can have a negative reaction to almost anything. In order to prove a common cause and effect, you require both a correlation and a mechanism. So maybe your friend's child did have a bad reaction to the vaccine, or maybe it just appears that way. In either case, there are thousands of scientists around the world attempting to find both a correlation and a mechanism for such events, and so far, neither exists for many of the things people are claiming. We have to accept a degree of risk with everything, while continuously trying to reduce that risk, and as far as medicine goes, vaccines are one of the safest bets you can make. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel for regular videos, like this video, and share it around to help us raise the bar of public discourse.